So thanks everyone for coming along today. Um, it's really great to see so many of you here. Today, the 2nd of April 2014, is the 15th anniversary of the foundation or the launching of the State Heritage Register, uh, which is one means we have of recognising culturally important places by heritage listing. This year, 2014, is also being marked by the International Council of Monuments and Sites as a year uh, of the heritage of commemoration in which they're looking at monuments and memorials particularly derived from or around the First World War. And so today I'll be talking about another way which we uh, commemorate and remember people and events from the past. Um, I worked uh, last year on a joint project that was run by Sydney City Council and the Royal Australian Historical Society uh, to reinstate missing green plaques and to research new plaques uh, from around Sydney. And this project, which you see on the screen here, Green Plaques Local Communities, um, seeks to take what I've learned from doing that work and some other work with plaque programs and the sorts of issues that come about when you're in got involved in such a program uh, and to then try and make that information available to communities and to people like you who are all planning plaque programs or who already do uh, look after or manage some sort of plaques. I'll give you a link at the end uh, to more detail about my particular project. Um, but so this presentation today um, will pretty much skim over the issues, but I hope you will find that interesting and useful. I've got another 14 slides to show you over the next 40 minutes. So that's about three slides, uh, sorry, three minutes per slide. So I won't take too long on any particular one and I hope you enjoy the pictures. The first, pla uh, sorry, the first um, slide you see up here is for the London Blue Plaques. This is the original commemorative plaque scheme that all the others now seek to emulate. It began in 1866 and was initially operated by the Royal Society for the Arts and it's operated pretty much uh, continually since 1866. It's gone through a number of different organisations and government agencies that have managed it and the only times that it didn't operate was um, towards the second half of the First World War and during most of the Second World War and just in the last year. So apart from that, there's a very long and continuous history. Over time, three uh, key principles have come to guide that program and they're very useful principles in any plaque program and I'll talk about them a little bit more. And you'll note I've got them up there. The all who run principle, the test of time and the event plus place principle. And you also notice the uh, simplicity and the brevity of the inscriptions on these plaques. There's a unity achieved by, the, they're all the same shape and they're all the same colour. They're all circles and they're all blue. They all have white writing on them. Now in the earlier phases of this program there are other shapes and other colours and there are different types of materials used. But by about the 1930s that had settled on this form and this is what they've stuck with ever since. And one of the things to note about that, it gives a unity to that plaque program and it makes any of these plaques instantly recognisable and it in fact makes other people want to copy them. And you might see the one on the far side over there called the Clink, the most notorious medieval prison, is not one of the standard English Heritage Blue plaques. It's erected by the London Borough of Southwark and they run a program, you can see on the bottom it says voted by the people in which people actually vote what they want the plaques to be for each year. So there's a number of ways you can go about doing these things but the point here is just once it's recognisable, other people want it and they will copy it which I take as a form of flattery. Now the Sydney Green Plaques. The Sydney Green Plaques program ran between 1984 and 1988 and the first of these plaques were put up in 1985. It was a joint um, partnership between the Royal Australian Historical Society, the State Bank, as it will, which no longer exists, and the Sydney City Council. But most of the work and the heavy lifting was really undertaken by the Royal Australian Historical Society. It culminated in 1988, this program, in a launch as a bicentennial event here in History House. There were 101 plaques installed in this series over a period of four years. And the one you see up here, Campbell's Bank, is number one. It's missing. I don't know where that is. The one you see over on the far side on the wall there is number 101, which is the State Bank, or as it was, the State Bank. And because the bank was paying for it, they got to choose number one and number 101, and they <laughs> And the history they tell of the number 101 is that the State Bank descended from Campbell's Bank. And there are, you, can, you might dispute some of that, but that was the story uh, that was told. Of those 101 plaques, I, I estimate there's about 30 of them are missing now. That's due to theft, to vandalism, demolition, neglect, 
a whole lot of issues there. And again, I'll cover some more of them a bit later on and how you might go about preventing that happening to any of your plaques or plaque programs. But of course, the Sydney plaques, Sydney green plaques, they have a history of their own. And you see the two buff coloured ones, I guess you'd say there. The Royal Australian Historical Society's original plaque program ran between 1919 and the 1960s and it was consciously modelled on the London Blue Plaques program. When the first of the plaques was installed, the one over here, First Government House site, in 1919, the newspaper reports at the time quite specifically say, we've seen how they do that in London and we want to do the same thing, we just want to do it better. You can see instead of a blue plaque with a white inscription, they inverted the colours and have a white, inscription, a white plaque with a blue inscription. So they were, they were consciously modelling it on that program. They wanted people to make that connection because it was about what was important. And people understood the London ones are important. Now they also include, as you can see here, a lot more decoration than those London plaques had. Another key difference with these and the London plaques, which I, again we'll talk about a bit more later on, number one, installed in 1919, first Government House site, was on the side of a building that no longer existed. Number six, down the bottom here, the site of the first General Hospital, down in the rocks, was also on the site of a lost building. In the London plaque scheme generally, they will not erect plaques on a building that's no longer there, yeah, if you get my drift. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Up in the top corner up there is the steel, a steel plaque from the steel plaques program that ran from the 1960s up until the start of the green plaques program. These plaques typically were placed on a pole on the curb. Lots of complaints in the newspapers about cars running into them, pedestrians walking into them and so on. As you can see, they're not as, quite as aesthetically attractive as the first series of the plaques there. And that one up there, uh, Greenway's house, which is also in the rocks, is the only one of them I've found still in probably its original location. But as you can see there, there are two series of plaques. There are these older ones, which are called the porcelain tablet series, and the other one which I call the steel plaque series. They don't seem to have actually had a name. And then the third of those series is the RAHS Green Plaque series. But just before I move on, just those two older plaques, if you look at them and compare them, I wonder if you notice there's two quite interesting differences in them. You see the little flannel flowers in the corner here, with this little centre in them. On this plaque, they're missing. And what you can see underneath is the screws that hold in these sort of four plaques together with the central one in the middle. And then when you have a look, the wreath around here is upside down. And what this can tell us is that this plaque has been taken off the wall at some stage. It's been moved or put away or whatever. When it's been put back, because they haven't had a picture of one next to them to watch or whatever, it's gone back on upside down and the corners, the, the flower centres have gone missing. The point I want to just make there is that's an issue about managing plaques over the long term and the sorts of things that can happen to them. It's important to understand for my project anyway, what is not a commemorative plaque, what I'm not including in this. And to just go around the circle here, these are what I call uh, an information sign, perhaps, which is a lot of text on it. Um, a war memorial, which we'd be familiar with. So it is commemorative, but it's not a plaque, although it has plaques on it. This uh, is an interpretation panel, and typically they have pictures, plans, maps, and a lot of information. They are on the site of where something happened, so they're it's like a community plaque in that sense. Here's a wall mural, so quite different, but nevertheless it's commemorating or, or reminding us. It's about a memory prompt about a street which is no longer there. A gravestone, again it's commemorative, but it's not what I'd call a plaque. A foundation stone, an information sign, directional sign here, even though it has, using two languages, gives it some commemorative or interpretive value. And a memorial plaque in a church, which is perhaps similar. Uh, this has got quite a lot of text on it, and on this one, although you won't be able to see, there is about three people um, mentioned on that. So for my, again, for my project, it's important to understand what is not a commemorative plaque for this purpose. And why I want to be clear about that is if you're planning your own plaque program, you also need to be clear about that from the start, because it's sort of a horses for courses argument. The resources you have, however much you have, will be limited and if you're not clear from the beginning what it is that you decide as a plaque and a commemorative plaque, you may find you suddenly have dispersed all your energy and your resources and you've got a whole lot of things you didn't really want. So you need to be clear on that right from the beginning. As I said, some of these are quite similar, some of them are quite different, but you should be clear what you want right from the start. Many of the issues I'll talk about from now on will apply to all of these sorts of plaques, so it's not that what I'll say is useless if you're planning an interpretive plaque program or something. 
but um, it's always always wise to keep this in mind. So the, the issues that I'll um, go through now, which you can see I've just written up here, about the three basic principles I touched upon before, the idea of the open air archive, funding and running, plaque program, materials for making plaques, the plaque shapes and colours, the siting and location of plaques, security of the plaques, and caring for plaques in the long term. And I mean the very long term, much after we're all long gone. Talk a little bit about the open air archive. It's useful, well I personally find it useful, to always have some sort of philosophy in your mind, what it is that you're trying to do before you start to do it. Helps you to keep on track, stops you getting diverted and going down all these interesting pathways but which ultimately become dead ends and you've wasted a lot of time and effort. And it's especially important if there's some sort of grant funding involved in your program. You know, your grant application, the people that give you the money will want to know right from the beginning what is it you want to do. So you need to be clear about this right from the start. So this idea of an open air archive is something that um, I've been working on developing a little bit. In this, each plaque we can consider as a historic record in its own right. It's telling us something about the past in the way it prompts us to remember. And then each of those plaques can form a series of plaques in the landscape. And there might even be several of those series. And I've illustrated before the three series that the Royal Australian Historical Society has conducted over nearly a century now. Each one of them is quite different, but also a lot of similarities. But you need to sort that out. They're not all the same. Some archival principles that come into play here. Firstly is the idea of provenance. Who made the plaques, or who will make them? Why did they do it? Are they marked on the plaque anywhere about what year it was made, or who the maker was, or something like that? The idea of stewardship. The plaques need to be managed. And in, in inherent in the idea of stewardship that is that you pass on something in a better condition than what you got it. So if you're already looking after plaques, stewardship is saying, what can you do to ensure that you pass them on in an even better condition? If you're setting up a plaque program, how do you try to put in place its mechanisms to ensure that happens? And understanding their original arrangement, which involves not moving them around, if it can, if it can be possible, so they don't end up upside down and missing parts of them is one, one outcome of that. If a plaque has been moved, might you consider returning it to where it used to be? There may be reasons you can't. If not, can the, that original arrangement be reconstructed in some way? And you need to understand that original context. Why did they put them up? Where they put them up? When they put them up? And on the bottom, I've got three little words there, dynamic, available to all, and embedded in the landscape. And these ideas come not so much from thinking about the Open Air Archive, but a book you might be familiar with, the Open Air Museum that Peter Spirit and uh, Dennis Jeans wrote nearly, uh, well, over 30 years ago now. Um, it's still a very useful publication if you work in landscape and history and trying to understand those connections. And from them, I get these ideas that historical records in the landscape are dynamic. They are always changing. They're deteriorating because of the weather. People come along and do something to them. So they're always in a state of flux, unlike a record, a paper record in a proper archive with a controlled environment. They're available to everyone to view. Everyone walks along the street and looks at them. There's no one standing there saying, you can't look at that because you're the wrong person. Everyone can do it. And so they can imagine their own histories and they can write them in their head. Uh, and they're embedded. They're a part of the landscape. They're not separate from it. And it's partly this is about the aesthetic qualities of a plaque. You don't want your plaque to look ugly. You want it to look good. You want people to be attracted to it and to try to take the message <coughs> you're telling there. And if a building is demolished, what happens to the plaque? The thing that was embedded in has suddenly disappeared. So what, can, what might happen then? And it's useful to keep these things in your mind when you're planning your plaque program and how it might plan out or pan out in the long term. And you'll see there's a little map up there. Uh, it's of a, the location of some blue plaques in the city of Christchurch in um, England. But in showing them like this, I hope it gives you some idea of that open air archive. There are those records, the little blue spots around in that archive which is the town itself. They're part of that landscape, they're embedded in it. So the three um, basic principles, the event plus place principle. The event that's commemorated in a plaque, and I'm drawing this from English Heritage, but it's the same ideas that I'm pushing in my project. Uh, the event commemorated in the plaque should or it must have occurred at the site where the plaque is. And, and the um, little clue that you can give yourself, the little test to say, if those people came back now from the past, would they recognise this site? And you can see that building up the top there with the green plaque on it 
That's the Tivoli, the plaque is for the Tivoli Theatre. It's near Belmore Park, down the south end of town there. The Tivoli Theatre is long gone, and if we applied that principle to it, if some of the actors from the Tivoli Theatre came back, would they recognise this site? Well, clearly they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, I'm saying you need to be clear about that from the beginning when you're organising your plaque program. The second of these, um, and there's also another point on that. I said before, English Heritage will not generally put a plaque on a building, on a site where the building's been demolished. And for those reasons I was just explaining, but also they had, do have a concern that it encourages or facilitates the demolition of historic buildings because people are prone to say, well, I'll put up a plaque. So that's all right, so they've got the history, you don't need the building. So uh, th these are things you, it's useful to remember. The all who run principle. In 1866, when the um, Royal Society for the Arts was first setting up its program, it stated that they wanted the plaques to be, quote, as concise and as distinct as possible to enable all who run to read them. So they, and their thinking was, they were putting these plaques up in the busy streets of London. Nobody could stop on the street because it was so crowded and it was busy and people were always moving. So there had to be enough information on them that someone walking along the street could read them and not have to stop and get hit by someone else or run over. So you can see there, they just have the, on that one down the bottom, it just has the names, what is being commemorated and the dates. And the English Heritage Series has a maximum of 19 words on a plaque. And believe me, trying to write in 19 words is a very, <laughs> it's very disciplined, it's a very, it's a good discipline and it, it, to enable you and to force you to say, what is it, why is it, what should be here? And that plaque up there, I think has 11 words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And yet it's, it tells you, you know, straight away what the point is that this man lived there and why he was important. The idea here is that the, as the person's moving along quickly, they can see that quickly, <coughs> they get enough information to provoke their interest to want to go away and find out some more. So in a way, we're encouraging each person to be their own historian. They might go home, they might Google this, they might, do, you know, they might have some of their books of their own and so on, they'll do a bit more research and they'll find out a bit more about it. It's not the book on the wall, which is what I would have called the, um, what I called the information sign back on that, earth, that first um, slide. You have to stand there and spend time reading it. And the third one uh, of these principles here is the test of time. This is the idea that some time needs to have passed, that the event itself has acquired some significance. This is not a contemporary fad or a fashion or a passing phase. There are things, and um, as you all know, there are things that can seem incredibly important today which tomorrow seem a bit ho-hum. So the test of time is about allowing enough time to pass so that uh, enough people do appreciate and understand something as being historic, and, and that's why it's being commemorated. Now again, it's not to say you shouldn't have plaques that commemorate contemporary things. It's just it, it would be a different type of plaque series, and you might call them something like cultural plaques, for example. They might be a different colour or a different shape. Um, again, in um, Britain, there's a lot of cultural plaques which, although they're circles, they're red, it's just as a, to make a distinction, and the, the primary colours clearly you know, make that quick distinction. But again, it comes back to what a couple of times I said, you need to be clear about that when you're starting your own program and planning it. What is it you're commemorating? Should the events be things that have passed the test of time, therefore they're historic? Or if they're not, or if you're going to have a mix, should you distinguish them in some way in the way you um, make the plaque? So, something a bit pretty for a moment, the plaque shapes and colours. And I mentioned before, standard shape and colour gives a clear identity to your plaque program. Plaques come in many shapes, and I've seen rectangles, squares, oblongs, triangles, free forms, by which I mean if you go down the Suez Canal in the rocks, there, there are plaques cut in the shape of human figures up the wall, and they each have a little inscription on them telling a story, so that, that's what I mean by free form. And circles. Um, circles, here we call them roundels. This is my favourite shape because it doesn't have a beginning or an end, and it implies something eternal and enduring. And, and I think these are concepts and ideas we want embedded in a plaque that we want to last for a very long time. New South Wales, or Sydney at least, has, a, has quite a nice history of using roundels to indicate important sites and places. And these ones up here, this is in the New South Wales Club in, um, I think it's O'Connell Street up there. This is on the gates of the Mint, and this is solid piece of cast iron. Uh, this is on Government House, obviously. This one here is a foundation stone from uh, 1925. That building has since been demolished and parts of it are sort of scattered around 
scattered around near the entrance um, where you go up here off Shakespeare Place, and it's actually made into a piece of public art. Um, you might have your views about that. Uh, and this one up here is down in the rocks. These are ones that were put on buildings to, to denote they were not going to be demolished. And although it's, I know it's an oval, it's not round, but um, it's the, that's a similar idea. Now the green roundel is a now characteristic style and shape used in Sydney for a commemorative plaque. And for those of you who are heraldists and, and love heraldry, will know that it, it actually has its own name. It's called a pum, and it comes from an old um, Anglo-French word for an apple, or a green apple, naturally. <laughs> so this one here is again one of the um, Green Plaque Program. This is the Conservatorium of Music, and it's number 31. This one here, this, <coughs> see it looks quite similar. That's because the State Bank, after the Green Plaque Program had finished, continued to make some of these plaques and put them up itself. So this one's down in Haymarket on the clock tower <coughs> down there. This one, which you can't read because it's in covered in this quite dense text and really would be what I call an information sign uh, rather than a commemorative plaque. There are a number of these around in Sydney if you look for them. I don't know who puts them up, um, but they seem to be something that's put on buildings as a planning approval because they um, have this quite a lot of history on them and it always usually ends up saying something about it's on the State Heritage Register, but there's nothing on them to indicate who put them there, and they're generally very difficult to read. This one uh, on the City Mutual Building is quite a nice one, but again, it's what I would call an information sign, really. But all of them use the green roundel, or the pum, to indicate its significance and its importance, and to draw your attention to it, even though with my, well, pretty much all of them, you're actually going to have to stop and read it, not while you're running up the street. So now I, you know, I would recommend if you're doing, if you're thinking of putting together a, pl a plaque program, memory plaque program, that you use the green roundel, especially if you're in Sydney. People know and understand what that means, so it will give you already a recognition value for what you're doing before you've even really done anything with it. Uh, running a plaque program, there's a lot, so much more to doing your plaques than just putting a plaque up, and I, I can't emphasise how much you should do a project plan first. Don't just jump in in the hope that it'll all just work out in the end. That's the road to disaster. A couple of points that I've got up there uh, about planning. Now look, you might, um, I would imagine right, most of you, if you're doing something like this, will be from an organisation, uh, probably a local historical society. Um, you should have a group or a subcommittee or something in your society who's, that works on this. If everybody thinks that's a great idea, Bob, you do it, straight away you know there's a problem, right? You need to have other people working with you on the, on the program, on the, pro, on the project. You should set out right from the beginning what the aims are of your project. And I've already covered that in a number of times and emphasised that. You know, what is it you're commemorating? Why are you doing it? You really want to understand the issue about planning approvals. The plaques have to go somewhere. And that is generally going to be on a building, and that means someone is going to have to give approval for it. You can't just run down the street and just bang them up on the wall. And especially if the building is a heritage listed building, you really take the time to speak with your council planning officers, uh, even with the heritage office if it's, if it's a state listed building. Find these things out before you do any of this. You plan these things first. Are the people working on it going to be all volunteers? Are they going to be paid? Or are you going to have a mix of the two? Again, there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these, but you need to think these things through first rather than think, oh, we should have paid someone to do that after the event. You might want to think about partners that are in this with you, and you might just see on the application form down the bottom here, the Royal Australian Historical Society, the Heritage Office, and the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage, there's a partnership operating there in, in terms of promoting um, a plaque program. And partnerships can be very good and very useful. Uh, you want, do you want sponsors? Are the sponsors going to pay for it or not? And the owners of the places you've got to put the plaques. These are all people you really want to be talking to and thinking about before you've actually made a single thing. Uh, the second one is about administering a program. Within you, you might have a group of people, there might be a board or a committee or something who are overseeing it, but it is useful to always appoint someone as your project manager, the person who's responsible for all the running around and who actually does the work. The, the actual design of the plaques, the manufacturing of them, and the installation of them are three quite distinct phases in a project. And if you've got a single project manager, that should keep these things moving along and keep them all tied together. You don't want the wheels to fall off when you've got them made and then you can't put them up, for example. And then there's the unveiling and the launch of your project. And this is very important. You can't just put them up and think, well, we've done, we've done it now. 
there's so much more still to do, then there's a handover to whoever's going to look after them in the long term. And even if it's yourself that's going to be looking after them, again, you need to be aware of that, that once you put them up, that's not the end. Funding. Now, look, do you already have some money for this? Uh, you know, you might be a society that's built up some money over time and so you've got some funds available. You might not have a single cent. What are you, how are you going to do about that? As grants, sponsorships, donations, fundraising activities, Who's going to organise these? If it's sponsorships and so on, what will the sponsors want in return? Do they want their logo on the plaque? Do they want their name running around it? Is that what you want on it? So is that the right sponsor for you? Most, of, most sponsors will have a clear idea of what they want to see on a plaque. And is that what you want on it? You've really got to be mindful of this. And again, you can't make the plaques up and then look for sponsors. You need to sort these things out first. Quotes from the manufacturing of the plaques, you know, get several of them. The plaques are to last a really very long time. There's no point going the cheapest one and find they're all falling apart in 10 years' time because you've just done, you've wasted everything you've done. Will you need to pay for the historical research that supports the inscriptions on them? Now, you, you know, you members in your society or your group may be able to do some of the research, but you may still need to pay someone to do research for you in some other place where you can't get to and so on. Do the committee members need their costs reimbursed for coming to the meetings and so on? All these things, I know I'm making it sound like, oh, this is all terribly boring and I've just gone off plaques now. But the thing is, they, if you want your program to, to work and to succeed, you want your plaques to be there in 100 years' time, you need to work these things out first. And I can't emphasise um, how important that is. And usually, look, in your group or society, there'll be one person who is good with this, you know, who's good at organising, who's, who, know, who is an accountant or something like this. Find that person. Now, so you've sorted all this out and oh, you're on your way. Where are the plants going to go and why should you put them where you put them? Should the, um, you know, and I go again back to that event plus place principle. That's where the plant should be. The plant should be where the event happened. But you may come to some other conclusion about it. It may not be possible to do that and so on. But often plants like that will have phrases in them that are, that are pretty, give you the clues, you know. Such and such lived here. Something was founded in this hall. Um, so and so was born in this house. So already you've got a very, you know, very simple little set of words there, but they relate directly to that place. The plaques um, preferably should be on a vertical surface rather than a horizontal one, as you can see um, down here. And that's really an issue about the maintenance and cleaning of the plaques uh, in the future. The plaques are on the ground; they can get they can easily get buried in the in the garden there, and so on. Ones on a vertical surface will tend to last a lot longer and keep their finishes. Preferably, they should be at or close to eye level. Now, this man, you can see this plaque is higher than this man. And he's standing out from the wall. When he stood back against the wall, he was up to about here, his head height. The plaque's right way up here. This is a very, this is my favourite example of a very bad plaque, because although the green roundel will attract you to it, you will not be able to read it unless only you've got binoculars or something. This is one of those ones that's got a, heat, a lot of text on it. It's very small. And then I was with three people a week, none of us could read that plaque. So you have to ask yourself then, well, what's the point of it? Who wasted their money putting it there? Now, of course, you can't always put the plaques at eye level. And there are ways to deal with that, though. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, they may need to be higher. But then the things you then go to, should the, the size of the round be larger? The minimal words is very important in this. The less words on it, the further it will be able to be seen from a distance. And the words should fill the plaque. There shouldn't be a little tiny thing in the middle of it. Again, if no one can read it, I keep saying, what's the point of doing it? And then, of course, they shouldn't be obscured, like this one here down in the Royal Botanic Gardens on Macquarie's Wall. Now, of course, when you're planning your plaque program, it's not always possible to know that someone's going to come along and plant a tree in front of it, or build a house extension, or that the branch is going to come over in front of it, and so on. But you can try to think about some of these things and about where you might place the plaque. But it also points to another issue about the maintenance of plaques in the future and the role in the planning system. You also need to consider security issues, in this case, about how you would fix a plaque to the wall, which will bring me to my next point. The security of plaques. Security covers a number of issues. And again, there's no point spending all this money doing all this work if after a week later it's gone. Physical security, which is probably the thing we'd mostly think about, theft and vandalism usually relates to, the, uh, theft in particular, will usually relate to the materials that the plaque is made from. And generally, if it's any sort of metal, it's likely to get stolen or someone will try to steal it. And this one here, some of the green plaques, these are aluminium plaques. I don't know if you can see, but someone's been trying to prise this off the wall, so the plaque's bent like this. Now, I'm not sure it's not for the metal value of the aluminium. I suspect 
given its location, is probably just drunk in your on a Saturday night. But it comes the fixing method has actually kept it on the wall, but that's not to say now it's bent, it won't attract them again. Citing the methods of fixing, the visibility about caring for plaques. Sometimes political vandalism can strike a plaque. This one here is from Ireland. Uh, it's a plaque to Kevin, um, Kevin O. Uh, sorry, his name just went quick out of my head. But there, he, was, he was a man there about, about which there are still strong political passions. He was assassinated in 1947 on this spot, which is why the plaque's there. And his memory still gets assassinated, metaphorically. It's an issue to consider in who you're putting on your plaques and can you deal with this. This one down here is in Canada, and that's just straightforward vandalism. Although it may also have a political message, it's red paint, and um, Sir John MacDonald did have a number of enemies in his day. And you see the other one up here, look out for brazen thieves. Um, this is from, um, it's talking about theft of plaques. This one's here from the War Memorial Park at the Petersham Park, Anzac Gates. Um, another one from the electricity station in Lenox Street in Marrickville. They're all bronze plaques and they're stolen for the value of the metal. Uh, so again, if you're going to use these sorts of things, these sort of materials, you really need to be thinking carefully about how you fix them there and what's the security around them. There are some other security issues though. Intellectual security, who owns the inscription once it's written up there? What if someone wants to change the words? Who, if someone comes and says, well that's wrong, you know? Who can give approval? Uh, who can contribute to the discussion? What about the moral rights of the author who wrote the inscription? These are all things you need to consider. Of course, the way you deal with that is, in, is to make sure your inscription is not wrong in the first place. And that's, that's about the integrity of your historical research and doing it properly. It also relates to a minimum number of words on the plaque. The less words, the less mistakes you can possibly make. There's the issue about the ownership of the plaques. Once they've been installed, um, who's going to care for them? Who's going to own them? Who's going to make any decisions about them? Who's going to notice if they go missing? You put them up there, do you still own them? This is not a very, that might sound like a simple question, but there's not a simple answer to it and it's not always uh, obvious to people. The ownership of the plaque site itself that the plaque is put on. The building owner's permission, you know, is always going to have to be sought to put the plaque up there. It's no good putting it up there and then have the owner saying, what are you doing vandalising my building? If a, a building owner wants the plaque to be there and is proud to have it there, they will take, they will be part of the security for it. They will take care of it. They will clean it. They'll look after it. It's very important to have them involved. So these are all questions you need to consider in planning your plaque program or if you're managing existing plaques, the sorts of things that can happen that you need to take into account. Well, we've only got two to go, so I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, types of materials for making the plaques with. The English Heritage plaques, the London Blue plaques, are uh, all uh, ceramic and they're all handmade and so that they do a small number each year. Ceramic uh, is a, it's a wonderful material, um, it's weather resistant and has a whole lot of advantages. Its disadvantages it's probably the most expensive of the materials as well. So again you have to weigh these things up. But those, that first Sydney series of plaques, the porcelain tablets, are again a ceramic and the ones that survive, survive very well. And you might have noticed on some of the green plaques that if you, if you put two of those together, one of them, one of the ceramic plaques, the ceramic ones will look better. They have survived, they weather better, especially in the Sydney um, salty mar maritime environment. Glass is another sort of earthenware you might consider, but again, you have to be careful about where you're placing something like that. In the metals is bronze, brass, steel, iron, aluminium. These are the most common ones. And bronze is the one that will most likely get stolen. Stone, marble, granite, slate, or malachite, if you're doing a green plaques program. Uh, all of these are all New South Wales materials, so you can, you can you know, you keep that um, local connection with them. And then there are artificial ones, plastic, fiberglass, or epoxy resin. These, these are the cheapest, but, it, but then you'll have an issue about how long they're going to last. So issues you might want to consider in deciding what material, firstly is the cost, and that's about what funds you've got available to you for your program. The durability, how long are they going to last, and what maintenance will they need to be looked after them. Availability is who can make it, where are they, and how long will they take to do it? Because people tell you lots of things on their website, but what, what's really going to happen then, how long will it take? Uh, the aesthetic qualities, which you've covered there before, about the colours, the texture, those different materials will have a different surface treatment on them, and which one you want to look um, good. Uh, how that will age, the patina that it will get over time. And again, you know, the porcelain is, Clearly the, the ceramic is clearly the thing that's going to look best over the long period of time, I think. 
uh, lettering, the typeface or the font, its colour. Uh, this up here, this font up here, is called London Blue Plaques. It's not, but it's not, it's not uh, owned or invented by the London Blue Plaques people. It was a commercial type developer person saw the green plaques, liked the font that they used, and developed his own one and made a commercial product out of it. London uh, English Heritage now wishes that they'd done that because the, the font they used had evolved over time and was developed by a number of people, particularly in the 1950s, but they kept no intellectual property over it. And so, you know, I said before about who owns the inscription, that's another part of who owns the inscription. The plaques could actually even generate income for you if they're, if they're beautiful enough that other people want to copy them. I don't know how much, I'm not saying they're a great money making venture. The size of the plaque will uh, have some impact upon the material you choose for it. The green plaques, Sydney green plaques, had a standard size of 295 millimetres, which is about a foot diameter. But actually there's a lot of variation in that. And in a random measuring I did of 10 plaques, I got eight different sizes. So um, although they were designed to all be a standard size, for reasons that are not known to anyone who's involved with the program, they're actually different size ones. The London the blue plaques come in three standard sizes, 316, 419 and 495 millimetres. They're what they are, they're standards. The bigger the plaque, generally the higher up the wall it is. You know, it's related back to that issue before about visibility and being able to read it. And they, then they do make one-off sizes if they need to fit in a particular place on a wall. So these are matters that you need to consider, again, as part of your planning. Selecting the right material is actually a lot more than just making it look pretty. It's, it's something that will, the plaque is going to last a very long time and the material is what will make it last. So in the long term, just to wrap up now, uh, can you see what's written on the plaque there? The, um, the asset management, preferably um, the ownership of your plaques once they're up there, needs to be with an enduring body, something that's going to last a long time. And typically that's going to mean some government body, a local council or a government agency. If you can get them to do that, if they're involved with your planning from the start, then that shouldn't be so much of a problem. What you really want them to do is to take ownership of them at the end and include them in their asset register. So they're checked on a regular basis. If they go missing, it's known. If they're damaged, it's known. Uh, and there's someone with a responsibility to do something and clean them up or fix them up and so on. But as I said, plan that from the start. You know, have the council or that government agency involved with your project right from the beginning. Don't assume that someone will look after them because they won't. The archives of the, of, and the records of your program, uh, they need to be, you will need good ones for your grant acquittal if you've got grant funding. Keep detailed records of all the historical research that supports the inscriptions. When someone comes back and says, you got that wrong, you want to be able to see in, your, in the records in the, of your research whether that is actually true. Just because someone says it's wrong doesn't actually mean it will be. And again, in the longer term, you may want to transfer those records to a local library, to the state library or some other similar body if you're worried about being able to uh, keep them in your own custody. Uh, makers' marks and the dates. Again, I really recommend that um, all of your plaques and ensure you include this in the contract you get with whoever makes the plaques. Uh, do have somewhere, in some little subtle way on the edge of the rim or something like that, uh, the name of the people that made them and the year that they're made. You know, XYZ Foundry 2015. That needs to be a little tiny mark there. But so someone looks closely, they can find it. Uh, that will help with getting replacement plaques for missing ones, with uh, getting additional ones made to the same specifications, uh, with repairing plaques in the future, especially if your, your, your paper records associated with the plaque program go missing or they're under someone's bed. And none of these things have been unheard of. Because, it, look, it won't be obvious to people within a few months of your plaques going up, who put them there and why they're there, any of these things. The plaque will become evidence of its own self. Uh, and finally, some publicity. Oh, no, sorry, my second last point there. It's a cipher. You notice those RAHS plaques had RAHS on them. The London blue plaques, the different people that have controlled them at different times have always made sure they've had their name on it somewhere, or they've had their coat of arms, or their emblem, or their symbol in some way. These help a viewer, when they're looking at it, to know who's responsible for the information that's on it, and they direct them back to you, so that's, that can be good for you. But they're also the plaques, the marks of authority, that what it says on that plaque is true, that that's authentic, that this has been properly researched by an organisation that knows what it's doing, and that this is genuine. It's not just someone just put it up there because they liked the look of it on their wall. And the final point is about publicity. Look, during, <coughs> right from the beginning of your, pro, of your program, um, during it, all the stages of it, during the unveiling of it, on anniversaries of plaque events, publicity is really important. We live in an age when we're saturated and drowned in the media, I know, and it's going to be difficult to get your voice heard. 
but particularly local um, media will often be very interested in what you're doing. But this helps to maintain local community esteem for your plaques. They see they're important, they go and look for them, they keep an eye out for them. It's another, in fact, it's another security measure, but it also ensures that your plaques will last for a long time. In particular, long after any of us are here. So just to, um, to conclude, this is my project here. This is the front page of it. There's the um, web address up the top there, and I encourage you to all go and um, have a look at that. It's the last page, so I'll leave it up there if you don't have to rush to, to write it down. Um, I really encourage you on the, um, what's this, the, the right-hand side of the screen, you can click the little button that says follow, and because that's good for me because the numbers go up, but it's good for you because every time I put something on there, you will get an, a message saying having a look. As I write each chapter or each section of the guide, it goes up on here, so it's not all there yet, but it, it will un be unveiled to you as time goes on. You can post your own thoughts and ideas and criticisms and so on on there. And it's a free uh, download, which is part of my grant that I got for it, so there's no charge for it. It's a Creative Commons license, so you can download it, you can copy it yourself, you can make whatever use you like of it, really. So remember, just some things I'd like you to take away in your mind. Putting up a plaque is just the beginning uh, of a long relationship. It's not the end of a quick project. In the, um, if the event and the place, event plus place, are important enough to commemorate on a plaque now, it's something that's already stood the test of time, then it should still be important enough in 50 years, in 100 years, in 250 years, and so on. Think enduring, think long, long term. Don't rush in like all who run, because they are your audience, they're not you. You are the people that have done it. There's no point in spending all this time, all this public money, all the grey hair you'll get if the plaque is neglected and forgotten about within just a few years' time. And that's the message I'd really like you to take home with you. Thank you very much, everyone. That was absolutely fabulous. You've got us all in thrall now. Plaques everywhere. <laughs> no, no, don't want plaques everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a, a few good ones. <laughs> of course. Are you happy to take questions? Yeah, of course. So, questions? Yes. Uh, hey, Bruce. The information you said, put as minimum on information on the plaque mm -hmm. as you, you should. The guess is actually where people actually find information about what's on the plaque, like more further information. Yeah. And you just Google, you could get anything which could be you know, right or wrong or yes, right. different or something. Yeah. So, have you any thoughts on that or are you including that in your practice? Oh, look, my, uh, the question is if someone go, looks at the plaque and then goes off to do some more research, how do they know what they find is actually any good? My thought, and, and from the, the little bit that I know about people who actually look at them and people who try to measure this is, the people who are interested enough to want to go and find out a bit more, generally have a bit of critical capacity and can tell if it's rubbish that they're looking at. If they're uncertain of what they might have found online or in a book, again it comes back to if it's got on the plaque quite clearly, you know, your society's name or something, they can come and contact the society then and say, look, I'm, you know, I found this or what, what do you think? So you, can, you, know, you engage them and they might become a member and so on. So you, you use it to your advantage. But look, you can't prevent the idiot factor. I mean, you know, you just can't. Question, Louise. The uh, Forsen tablet yes. at um, Elizabeth Farm, I think, is in a very poor condition. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for the conservation? Uh -huh. of That's, well, I'm not sure because I don't know who actually owns them anymore. Yeah. It's a good question, isn't yeah. it? I don't know. Is this, uh, one at Experiment Farm Cottage, um, at the back of that mm. now public park in Alice Street, and then um, there's one at a sort of side street next oh, to yeah. a little park for Elizabeth yeah. Farm. Yeah. Not where you'd expect to see it at all. <coughs> neither of them are where you'd expect to find them, and neither of them are in brilliant condition. And are they in that porcelain tablet series? Yes, yeah, they are. Yeah. You look, the Every just... time you look at them, your heart sort of bleeds yeah. for them. You think, oh! <laughs> Poor thing! Yeah. <laughs> something <laughs> should be done! The, you know, my best suggestion with something like that is is that you d actually try to do a bit of research on the plaque itself mm -hmm. and when it was put there um, and uh, who, and if it's actually in the place where it was put, is a useful <laughs> thing to find out. In um, the 2001 RAHS journal, there's a light blue coloured one, like a, you know, it was a centenary ed edition, and it actually has an appendix in it that lists all of the plaques that had been put up. You can work out a bit from that when, because you know they, they went up over time, and Trove will actually, I found I think just about all of them are going through Trove, mm. because they always mention it good publicity when they, when they open Putting them. Putting one up. Yeah. Um, so it, look, it may be you know, that the council there may take responsibility for them or, or whatever, I'm not sure, but the, the thing, the unknown is 
an issue with them. Presumably, if they're on council land, mm -hmm. it's more a council issue than Sydney Living Museums or National Trust. Look, it probably <laughs> is, but you, but but you don't know until you yeah. actually go and find out. But that's what I'm saying. Is you do this from the beginning of your program, so you've got that in place already. Dave, Sorry. Just, just, thanks, Bruce. I enjoyed that very much. Um, one practice that I've seen adopted in some places is rather than putting the plaques on the walls of buildings, they're embedded in the little plaques next to the oh, yeah. buildings or the sites that they're commemorating. Have you got any comment on that? Um, so, I mean, around Sydney, there's quite a lot of plaques set into the into the ground, yeah. especially around Circular Quay and so on. I look. There's just a couple of things I'd just I'd note about them, I guess. There is one series of plaques around in Circular Quay that are set in the ground in which every bit of the plaque has been worn away. And all that's left, it's got a band around it that says some um, Sydney Heritage Trail or something like that. But the, the actual plaque in the middle of it was like an anodized, you know, the um, etched aluminium plaques. So the, the traffic over them has actually worn them away and they're just like a flat disc in the middle. So there's an, there's, that's an issue. The, um, some of the others, though, down there look quite good. Different material is used for them. But I also, you know, I also have a bit of a thing about if the plants in the ground and people are really are walking all over them, are they really showing any respect for what it is that you're commemorating? So, I mean, that's just a personal view. So I prefer that people didn't walk on them myself. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, I've got two. I'll go, you go first, then. Yeah. Um, the porcelain parts less likely to be stolen than the metal parts, or people want them for their <laughs> for the fireplace. Yeah. 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 Look, I don't look. I don't have any uh, statistics to prove that one way or the other. But um, all of the you saw that little newspaper cutting I had up there. Now I collect these wherever I find them, and they are always about metal plaques, and it's the metal that people are stealing them for. You know, even I've seen up in, in the Blue Mountains where I live, I've seen a plaque got, got stolen a week after it was put up uh, to, to commemorate, a, to mark an uh, opening of a hot bit of highway. But there, nobody was stealing it to put on the mantelpiece, it was for the metal, I'm sure. Yes, and then. As part of the Sydney City Council register of plaques, I walked the streets of Forest oh, Park, yeah. I believe, yeah. and counted and transcribed and photographed and measured and everything else, 119 plaques, but I realised based upon your criterion that probably 20 of them are genuine plaques according to you. Yeah. <laughs> so there's just such a variety yeah. and I just wonder how do you decide what is a plaque and what is not a plaque? And, and one, one, excuse yeah. me, one yeah. other thing, there are a number of plaques which give you no idea of when it was put in or who put it in. There's one in Bay Street which just says Lady Lawson. Now, she was the wife of the governor yeah. of New South Wales, but there's no nothing to indicate why it's there. <laughs> And look, the, look the, um, just on, your, on, your, on the last point, there's a very good reason why um, you, you need to mark the plants with things like the maker's marks and so on, but you need to make sure the inscription you're putting on it actually means something. Because while it meant, I'm no doubt that was something very meaningful when Lady Rawson stepped there. I think it was 1908 Yeah, but, but it's very quickly these things are forgotten. And, and when they're forgotten, when the meaning's forgotten and detached from the plant, that's when they'll start to go missing as well. More from neglect and people not caring. And on the other, how do you define the plaque? Look, the, look, what's there already, I mean, they are what people have considered to be plaques, and I, I'm not you know, saying that they're wrong or anything. But my argument is, if you want a plaque that's memorable, that's going to last a long time, the short inscription that, that's associated with the place that people can see quickly, are, you know, the London blue plaques, the experience of that is they are the ones that last and that people remember. You know, you look for, you just Google London plaques, you'll get hundreds of the blue ones. You'll get some other things, but they are the ones that people think are the plaques that matter. Yes, another question. Uh, you touched upon uh, a plaque on a building and the owner values the plaque and mm -hmm. therefore will look after the plaque. And I think this is important. And often I think plaques have a, a, a commercial value. They attract customers. Mm -hmm. And a little personal experience here, I have a, a little spot in Paris that I rather like, and there's a hotel there that I stayed in, and it drags me back again because old Gauguin lived here. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, and the French, they do value their intellectuals and their mm -hmm. artists. And if I can't get into that hotel, I go down the road, and it says Anatole France. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Keep it in mind that if there's a commercial value to a plaque, it's likely to be looked after and it's likely to be appreciated by a lot of people. 
But thank just you. A comment, please. No, thank you. It's a very good point. And um, there are, uh, again, in London, I haven't seen this in Sydney, um, but there are, uh, like, you can see real estate agents' advertisements for houses, and you'll say, this is a blue plaque house for such and such. And, so, and that's seen to add some value to it, that the person living there has this association with this place. And perhaps we'll get that in Sydney one day, but I haven't seen them yet. But, but thanks, a very good point. Thank you. Please, again, join me in thanking Bruce for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.